this talk, I will present to you the backward euler Maruyama method for SDEs with a multivalue diff coefficient. This talk is based on a joint work with Rafael Kruse, Mihaly Kovac, and Steve Walsh. The overall goal of this talk is to approximate the strong solution x of the multivalued differential, uh, multivalued stochastic differential equation on a finite time horizon, where f is a maximum monotone mapping. That means in particular that f of x can be a whole set of points and therefore instead of having an equality here, we just have this inclusion. Then we have a filtered probability space, omega, which is the standard FT adapted Wiener process, B and G are Lipschitz continuous functions, and X0 is an integrable initial value. One nice application of such um, multi-valued stochastic differential equations is that we can interpret a discontinuous drift coefficient f as such a multivalued mapping. I will show you an example for this something later in this talk. Um, the numerical approximation of STEs is a very active field. Um, the numerical approximation has been considered in many works. Just to um, mention a small selection, there's a few works here where um, explicit schemes have been used though. Um, the um, analysis of multivalued uh, equations, both stochastic differential equations and stochastic partial differential equations, um, have been worked on before, and also the numerical analysis has to some extent been considered in some of the works here. Um, before we come to the numerical scheme, um, let's just fix the setting of what it means to have a solution of such a multivalued equation. A multivalued equation has such a tuple of x and eta as a solution, where x is an FT adapted process which is L2 integrable both in omega and the temporal interval, and the sample paths are almost surely continuous. So the role of x in this equation is quite clear, but here is also an FT adapted process which is L1 integrable and omega almost surely and um, since f of x is always can always be a whole point of sets eta will always be the one selection of this set such that this inclusion here becomes an equality so it's always one particular uh, selection of f of x then, since we assumed f is a monotone um, mapping, we would eta to ensure this monotonicity further on, so we basically want something like f of x minus something f of y tested with x minus y is, uh, is non-negative, so that the monotonicity is preserved. Then, um, such an equation has an inexact solution. If um, we have this mapping f, p is a value between 1 and infinity, q is its current conjugated Hölder coefficient, f is maximum monotone and coercive, um, that means we have this kind of um, lower bound. We want f to be bounded, that means in here in particular we, that f fulfills a polynomial growth condition with the leading exponent um, p minus 1. b and g are Lipschitz continuous and we have this kind of integrable initial value. Then the multivalued equation is uniquely solvable, where x is um, Lp integrable both in, in omega and 0t, and eta is Lq integrable in the same um, in omega and 0t. Um, to, in the, to just ensure the existence of a solution, we could drop the coercivity and the boundedness. These are just uh, necessary to prove these uh, integrability conditions, which we will need later on. So we will um, just assume coercivity and boundedness in the following as well. Then um, we will uh, use the following um, scheme to approximate this solution. We want to use the backward euler Maruyama method with n temporal steps, a step size k, which is t divided by n, an equidistant grid with grid points tn, which is n times the step size k, an increment of the Wiener process here, and then we consider this type of recursion where we have an implicit scheme considering f and b and an explicit scheme in uh, g to ensure the measurability. Um, now, as I've already mentioned in the beginning, um, one 
nice application of such multivalued mappings is that we can nicely interpret a discontinuous drift coefficient um, as a multivalued mapping. Um, so here we can then quite nicely see that the multivalued setting will become necessary to solve these implicit steps. So let me show you an example for this, um, but since b is a nice regular term, we will just drop it for now um, to simplify the notation and just concentrate on f. So um, let's say we have a discontinuous drift term. So let's just say it's a, it's a single valued mapping. Then um, if we want to solve one single um, backward Euler step, um, we obtain some kind of equation like this. So x is equal to minus f of x plus y, where r, y just contains everything like the, um, the stochastic um, perturbation and everything. So y can basically take on every value since um, the uh, Wiener process can, um, the, can take on every value. So let's just say um, f is a jump function which is minus 1 for negative values and plus 1 for positive values and um, on the jump point we can just define it as whatever we would like it to be. Um, then if y would be just 0 our implicit equation would mean that we have to solve an equation x is equal to minus f of x. Um, this equation would only be solvable if the value c was chosen as 0, which now seems like a good idea. Um, it's exactly the mean value between these two points, so sure, why not? But then y could just as well be the value 1. Then our implicit equation would become x is equal to minus f of x plus 1, which then is only solvable if c is chosen as 1. If y... <coughs> is an arbitrary value between 0 and 1, we always have to choose c as the value y to ensure that the implicit equation is solvable. And a bit more general, if y um, is an arbitrary value in r, um, we need to include this whole set of points in between the jump to make sure that the implicit equation is always solvable. So f um, basically is a monotone mapping since it's monotonely increasing. And so if we assume that f has to be maximum monotone, the maximality can be seen here by this um, jump that we include all the points in between to ensure that the implicit equation is solvable. Um, if, um, on the other hand, you would like to uh, use an explicit equation here, um, it does not really make sense to um, interpret the jump as a multivalued setting like this because then it's not clear which um, of these many points you should have to choose. Um, in the implicit equation, um, the uh, implicit equation really dictates which point we choose, so even though we have a multivalued mapping, the solution will always be single valued. Um, so, um, this multivalued setting really only makes sense in an implicit um, type of equation. Then, a bit more general again, um, this type equation of equation is um, solvable if f is a maximum monotone operator, b and g are Lipschitz, we have an integrable initial condition, then for every step size we get ftn adapted families xn and eta n, such that eta is always an f of x, and x and eta fulfill this type of equation. This um, solvability can be, uh, can you can get solvability by applying a broader Minty theorem for maximum monotone operators. Uh, so there's suitable general results to prove this existence. Then, um, also in the uh, analysis later on, we need some kind of a priori bound. So here we additionally assume coercivity and boundedness again to get the right kind of bounds. Um, and then we get um, a discrete L infinity in time L2 in omega bound for x, a discrete Lp in time Lp in omega bound also in x, and for eta we have a discrete Lq in time Lq in omega bound as well, which exactly corresponds to what we had for the exact solution, but now in a discrete set, with the additional coercivity and boundedness conditions. Then we can prove a convergence result. So um, if we assume that f is maximum monotone, 
coercive and bounded and additionally fulfills this angle boundedness condition. Um, I will show you in the proof later on how this can be used. Um, this assumption was first proposed by a, in a paper by Nocetto, Savary and Verdi in 2000 for a deterministic problem and <clears throat> this uh, assumption is is fulfilled for example if f is the subgradient of a convex potential so there's a vast class of example problems where this kind of inequality rule is fulfilled. Then again b and g ellipses continues we have an integrable initial condition and then um, we get a convert um, rate of convergence of one half uh, one over four for this type of problem. Um, let me show you the idea of the proof for this kind of um, equation. Um, but to make everything slightly more simple, let's not do look at the proof in this general setting, but let's make some simplifications. Um, the term b in was for the also for the drift coefficient, but something. Um, Lipschitz continues so very regular so this actually doesn't cause very much problems and doesn't really uh, contain the main idea of this proof so let's just drop B completely and G was for the diffusion coefficient and we had some um, mul multiplicative noise here but um, to simplify this let's just say G is constant and uh, therefore we have an easier type of noise to consider here um, which will be so it's a bit easier to see the main idea of the proof and then you just have to add some more technical details to really um, include this um, more general functions in the end but the main idea is still the same so then for the proof we have to start by setting up some notation so our we have the, the numerical solution of the scheme xn which we would now like to um, put on the tem entire temporal interval so what we do is we want to have a function that is xn minus 1 at the point tn minus 1 and xn at the point tn and a linear interpolation in between. We do the same thing for eta and call this fx since this is basically what eta is actually meant to be and <clears throat> then we also want to have a second type of um, interpolation which is constant so in the entire temporal interval between tn minus 1 and tn we want the x overline to be xn so we have a constant interpolation and we do the same thing with eta and have the uh, denote this by fx overline um, then basically the main um, tool for this proof was to find a suitable representation of the error and um, here the, we have the error squared, which we can estimate by three different summons, where one here just contains eta and x. This part here just contains a quadrature error for a stochastic integral, um, where capital G is the exact um, eta integral of um, um, the Wiener process with respect to G, and curvy G is what we get out of the scheme so it's basically an approximation for this stochastic integral so this part here uh, consists of a quadrature error here uh, we again have something containing eta and some kind of quadrature error again um, but again to make this a bit more accessible let's make the whole problem even more simple instead of having a constant g let's just say for now um, that g is constantly zero. So all the quadrature errors disappear um, because we don't really have a stochastic integral anymore and we just end up with a purely deterministic problem. Let's understand this first and then add the uh, additional terms to see what happens with um, a stochastic integral in, the, in there as well. So uh, for g equal to zero we have the deterministic problem um, where we have two equations. So we have an integral equation for our exact solution um, um, and we have an integral equation for our numerical solution which really corresponds to what we see here. So we have the linear interpolation here plus the integral of the constant interpolation of eta. 
And then to consider the error, what we do is we consider the difference of x and curvy x, which then <clears throat> only contain, contains um, terms that um, um, contain eta. So what we do is we consider um, this type of error, since it only contains eta terms, we denote it by e eta. And e eta is an absolutely continuous function. Um, since this is represented by this integral, it's absolutely continuous, um, where the derivative is the integrand of, the in of this integral. Um, for such a regular error, we can use a nice type of representation. So this norm squared can be represented by um, the integral of the uh, derivative of the error tested with the error itself. And then when we in, uh, insert back the definitions of these terms, we end up with this term here, which looks like something where we can hopefully use some kind of monotonicity assumptions, since this is always something f of x somehow, while this is x, so hopefully somehow monotonicity can help us with these terms. So let, let's look at this a bit more closely. Um, looking at the integrand um, of the integral here, we start by inserting the definitions of these functions. So we have our constant interpolation here, we have our linear interpolation here, and we just inserted how they were defined to be. And then the first term here that we have, um, this can now be estimated using the angle bounded condition that we um, proposed in the theorem. So let's look at this. We have um, basically um, some, um, we have exactly the same structure where we have f of something here, we have ha f of something which is not exactly the same value as we have here. But this by assumption can now be bounded by f of this value minus f of this value which has a much nicer structure. And um, what we see here is then that we can kick out the exact solution out of the uh, bound and therefore um, get a pure a posteriori bound <coughs> with this term here without the exact solution included. Um, the second part here can just be approximate uh, can just be left out since now this is in the graph uh, of um, x so this is an element of f of x this is an element of f of x y and therefore we can use the monotonicity consumption um, to see that this is greater or equal than zero since we have a minus sign here we might as well drop the whole term so therefore we are actually almost done with the first um, de with a purely deterministic problem so our error um, we could uh, represent this by this integral equation inserting um, the bound we have just proven, we get this part here. So just purely inserting what we saw here. And <clears throat> this integral that we have can easily be um, computed. And we end up with this kind of sum, which is now exactly um, what we wanted to prove. So we have the uh, error squared is bounded by um, this type of sum. So this is how we um, get the error representation for the deterministic problem. But what we now would like to do is we would like to also include the, um, a, a more general G um, to get to a stochastic problem. So we also would like to include these further terms here. And um, this can be done by now um, going back to a constant g, um, we can still represent our error um, as the difference of the exact solution minus um, the uh, linear interpolation of our numerical values. And now this error consists of two different terms. So we still have the error that comes from eta, very similar to the, or actually exactly the same as in the deterministic problem. Plus, now we have this additional error that comes from G, which is a quadrature error. Now, the problem with this quadrature error is it's not absolutely continuous because uh, we don't have the suitable regularity in the eta integral. But what we can still do is um, we can represent um, the um, eta error as this is still absolutely continuous, it has still exactly the same structure as we had on the deterministic problem. So we can use 
the same identity as before and now um, we would kind of like to get the same structure as before so we would like <clears throat> this integrand tested with the error but um, if we test this integrand here with e eta we would have to test it now with the entire integral because we have this additional g um, so what we do is um, we insert that e eta is the entire error minus e g um, and then we obtain this, this part here, which is exactly the same as the new deterministic problem and some kind of mixed error where we have an eta error and an error from the quadrature. Then altogether the entire error is, uh, can be estimated by the sum of the eta error plus the quadrature error which, um, as we have just seen, the eta error is exactly what we had from the deterministic problem, plus this kind of mixed term here, and here this is the uh, quadrature error. And then we're actually done. <clears throat> as we have the error representation that we wanted to have, here this is exactly what we had in the deterministic problem, the blue part is the mixed error that we can bound by using Hölder's inequality ones and the green part is the pure quadrature error. And now um, looking at these single parts we can actually ease, uh, we can get to the final error bound. So here we have a quadrature of a stochastic e to integral um, and since g is a regular constant term right now, um, the quadrature um, error will be of order one half. Um, so this is basically some standard results. So the quadrature error will be of k to the power of minus uh, of one half basically. And then um, here we have our numerical eta, we have our exact eta. We don't really know anything about the difference, but we know that both of them are LQ integrable. So this integral here might not get small, but it's definitely bounded due to our a priori bounds. Then what we have here <coughs> is another quadrature error, which we can again show is of order one half, and therefore um, the blue part will always also be of order one half. <clears throat> so the last remaining term is the red part here, which is exactly what we also have in the deterministic problem. Um, <clears throat> so let's look at this part and then we're done with the proof. Um, if we, when we look at this part, the first thing we do is we reinsert the scheme for this difference here. Then we have two different parts um, for the scheme. Um, which we can then um, subdivide into two single summons um, and look at these summons separately. For the first summon, we, we can again use some identity that we have in mind. So this kind of structure ends up to be um, this um, combination of the norms of the single terms. And now this is positive. We have a minus sign here. so. Um, we only make it larger by dropping it. These two terms here have a telescopic sum structure, so we only end up with the very last term and the very first term. Um, and again, um, this is positive. We have a minus sign here. We might as well drop this part here. This is bounded um, due to the regularity of the initial value and uh, the boundedness condition on f. So therefore this first term here is of order um, uh, 2. So let's look at the second part here. Um, here first <clears throat> we notice that um, eta i minus 1 is independent of the increment of the Wiener process therefore we might as well drop it. Um, for <clears throat> the remaining terms we use Hölder's inequality to get an LQ norm of eta, which we know is bounded due to the a priori bounds. And we have a second bound here, which contains the increment of the Wiener process, which is of order one half. Therefore, altogether, this is of order one half. And therefore, the whole bound is of order one half, which proves that the error squared <coughs> um, is of order one half.
which completes the proof. So now let me finish this talk by um, giving you two examples that fit in our setting. The first part is something that we've already seen sometime before. So we can now um, allow for a discontinuous um, uh, um, drift coefficient f, um, which is such a jump by in, um, including all the points in between the jump points as some multi-valued set. Um, then B and G are Lipschitz continuous and the initial value is L2 integrable. So that would be the first part. <clears throat> and then secondly, we can allow for a, st um, for a spatial discretization, for example, of a um, stochastic partial differential equation, namely the P Laplacian, where for P between 2 and infinity, D a bounded Lipschitz domain, uh, a homogeneous Dirichlet -like boundary condition, um, uh, Lipschitz continuous uh, psi and a suitable initial condition, we can use a Galyakin scheme um, to discretize this um, equation and end up with this um, type of setting here, which then can be rewritten into an equation in Rd, where uh corresponds to the function x. Um, the um, um, differential operator here um, fulfills all the um, boundedness, coercivity and monotonicity conditions that we imposed on f. It's not multi-valued but it doesn't really have to be. Um, then we have our initial condition which is suitably integrable and we have our multiplicative noise which uh, we assume to be Lipschitz continuous and therefore really all the terms um, have the right kind of structure that we would like it to be. And with this I would like to end the talk and thank you for your